Right, I've got a whole stack of notes here, and uh, I've got them all ready, and I've decided to ignore them. We're just going to do a bit of freestyle Bible preaching, is that alright? Don't often do that. So I'm going to be wandering around the stage with my Bible like this, and just talking to you from it, and we're literally just going to go through. I've changed the whole structure, because I've seen who's in, and I want to change some of the emphasis, and I'm going to do it on the spot, so no pressure at all. Okay, are we ready? Are you ready, Helen? Fasten your seatbelt. Verse 1, here we go. John chapter 3, the top, uh, bottom of 749. Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a member of the Jewish ruling council. He came to Jesus at night and said, Rabbi, we know you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one could perform the miraculous signs that you are doing if God were not with him. Up to this point in the Gospel, Jesus has been causing gasps. We've seen them over a couple of the last weeks, and we've seen how the Lord Jesus has demonstrated a power. A power that even the most learned people could not explain. And some of them had had this brush with Jesus, and it had meant that they wanted to know more. And the guy that is picked here to be an example of this is a guy called Nicodemus. I could, like trendily try and cut it down to Nick but that sounds condescending so we'll keep calling him Nicodemus so we have to with that so with Nicodemus I seem to recall his name means strength and power but what we learn about him there is that there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus now the Pharisees were your hardcore religious zealots there were about 6,000 of them and if you wanted to become a, a Pharisee you didn't have to be like a full time pastor or priest you could have another job you could make tents do whatever you liked but you made a public de- declaration that you wanted to try and get near to God and honour God and you were going to go OTT in order to keep all the rules and regulations. So they were like sort of Ten Commandments junkies. They would go through their Ten Commandments and go, right, this is what it looks like to follow God, this is what it looks like to get near God. This is what... And they would like, out of each of the Ten Commandments, they'd like put extra rules on top. So whereas it said... Uh, you know, don't do any work on the Sabbath day, which was a Saturday. They'd go away and think, well, what does it look like? I know, making work, some people who do work, is what they do is they, um, uh, they make bricks and mortar and they build walls. So we don't want to do that. We don't just not want to build a wall. We don't even want to make mortar. And we've noticed that when you spit on the ground, it turns into something that looks a little bit like mortar. So what we're going to do is to make sure we don't mess with any of God's laws, not that they were God's laws, they'd sort of like make it gone a bit crazy, but, you know, sort of nuts, they, they were so strict that they would, on a Sunday, well Saturday was their Sabbath, they would not spit on mud, but they could spit on a rock. Because if you spat on mud, it made water, which was like doing work, but if you spat on rock, it just evaporated. Yeah? These guys were hardcore OTT. They were disciplines. I mean, I, I'm really made up. If you've heard of some of the books in the Old Testament of the Bible, these guys would have memorised them all. You know, so at the beginning of the year, when I encourage you to read through your bits of the Bible, and you sort of got to sort of Leviticus, and you go, ah, uh, they would have been like, let's memorise it, baby. They were respectable. They were looked up to. They were, in some sense, viewed as the hope of the nation. We find here as well, we find with Nicodemus, he wasn't just a Pharisee, he was a member of the Jewish ruling council. He was socially involved. He didn't just give to comic relief, he organised comic relief. He had friends on Facebook, baby. He was successful. He had everything going. And yet, his whole life was like that because he was looking for something more. His whole life had been on the lookout. Because part of the reason these Pharisees wanted to live like that was because they looked out on the same broken world that you and I do, they read the same newspapers, and they see that this world is crippled and broken. And they look back in their Old Testament, and they thought to themselves, hold on, how can I, how can we find an answer to the brokenness that is our lives they said, and our lives here today. How can... They wanted a power from outside, and so what they did was they kept all these rules because they hoped it in some way would get them closer to ultimate reality. Something real that they could bite down on. Something they could find. And of course they were hoping in some way it would be God. So they thought, keep all the rules and perhaps God will we'll get in with God and we will get that ultimate thing. And I suppose, in, although they did it religiously, they're not that much different to people like you and me. Because everybody you know, and we're exactly the same, we're all on the lookout for something. 
that is going to be our answer to the things that are broken in this world, the place where we can go to get a bit, bit of peace, where we can find some identity, that in some sense perhaps we can connect to the divine, and perhaps it's by going out and looking good, perhaps it's by getting loads of more stuff, perhaps it's by just getting the family just how I want it to be. You know this, and we talk about this all the time, we're always looking, we're on the lookout for something that will deliver what the Old Testament spoke about as the kingdom. This idea of everything being put right by God. And Nicodemus had had this brush with Jesus. And look what he says in verse, verse 2. He came to Jesus at night and said, Rabbi, so he shows him respect. He says, like, teacher. Okay? Rabbi, we know you are a teacher who has come from God, and no one could perform the miraculous signs you are doing if God were not with him. So in that moment, they looked at what Jesus was doing, and what did they see? They saw Jesus doing the thing that they've been looking for, fixing the brokenness. And so they go, Jesus, we've been obeying all these teachings to be able to get what you've got and to be able to bring what we hoped would come. Can you teach us, please? We're going to come humbly, though we think we've got lots of the answers. We're going to come to you. Tell us what is the secret. Teach us. How do we get this kingdom? How do we get it? Give us what we need. Tell us what we can do so we can obey more. You've got some sort of inside track. You're some sort of guru, fortune cookie kind of guy. I don't know what it is, but teach us more so we can obey and we can get this, this ultimate reality we're looking to. Understand where he's coming from? And so what does Jesus say? Uh, in reply, verse 3, Jesus declared, I tell you the truth, no one can see the kingdom of God unless... He is born again. Now, I know sometimes we find the words of Jesus a little bit confusing, a little bit off-putting from time to time, but can you imagine what it must have been like for Nicodemus? He walks there and says, tell me the things that I need to know about, teach me what I need to do, and Jesus turns to him and says, listen lad, you've got to be born again. If you want to see the kingdom, if you want that thing that everybody is looking for in their life, if you want it, you've got to be born again. Oh, he thinks. And because he thinks like this, he thinks, right, well, the way I get to see the kingdom is by doing more stuff. He starts to think about it. He thinks, hold on, Jesus has gone all Yoda on me and all cryptic and fortune cookie type of thing. I'm trying to work this out. What he must mean is, as I look back on my life, the teachings I have followed, the rules that I've tried to obey, I must have missed some or something when I was younger. So what I need to do is like, I need to go back and like reboot it and start over. And then I look at the old dear of a mother and I'm like, that can't work. In fact, verse 4, what does he say? How can a man be born when he is old? Nicodemus asked. Surely he cannot enter a second time into his mother's womb to be born. And he's thinking about his old mother. And if his old mother had been standing there, she'd have just been going, Ouch! That doesn't look really quite nice at all. He's got all kinds of funny pictures round in his head, because the long and the short of it is, he's clueless as to what Jesus is getting at. Have you noticed how when Jesus speaks, he always speaks about realities beyond what we can see? And for Nicodemus, he was trapped in this way of thinking about how you connect to God. How you become part of the kingdom. That it is through the following of teaching you obey. So Jesus comes to him again in verse 5 and he reiterates. He says, I tell you the truth. Whenever Jesus says that, you want to listen. I tell you the truth. No one can enter the kingdom of God unless he is born of water and the Spirit. He's trying to totally rehang Nicodemus' understanding. Nicodemus thinks, follow the teaching, kingdom breaks in, I get access to God, I want to be part of that, I'm disciplined, I'm moral, I'm respectable, I've done all of this, I've memorised the Bible, and Jesus says, sorry mate, you're barking up the wrong tree. All those things may be good, but those things don't get you into my kingdom rule. They don't get you what you're looking for. What you need is a total reboot. You know when you get a virus on your computer? And you call in all the people who say they know how to deal with computers, like Weston, I can speak ill of him because he's outside, and they come along and have a little play. Bring my father-in-law, he brings up all his cables and all his extra discs and all that, and and by the end of it, the computer is in even more of a mess than when you start. And so what you suddenly realise is you need to blank the whole thing, and you need to reboot with a total new operating system. 
And that's exactly what Jesus says. Nicodemus, Nicodemus. Nicodemus! Prostitutes? Yeah. But Nicodemus? Scumbag gangsters? Yeah. But Nicodemus? Do you see what Jesus is saying? He said, no matter how together your life is, you must be born again. No matter how much your life is falling apart, you must be born again. And some of you sit there and say, well, oh, Steve, you don't know how, how, how bad things have got with me. And Jesus is basically saying to Nicodemus and to you and me, you're starting from exactly the same place as Nicodemus is. He's no further ahead of you. For all his good comings and goings, Kev, if you need to sleep, do it out there, lad. All right, you're working, I can see you labouring hard to fight off the sleep. That's the fifth time you've nodded your head, mate. I'm glad you're in, but get a comfy chair, will you? Poor Claire's sitting there going like this. She's going to get repetitive thing syndrome in a minute, all right, mate? Tell you what. Right, where were we? Okay, hold on. I forgot where we were up to. We're on Nicodemus. Right. So here we are, verse 5. I tell you the truth. No one can enter the kingdom of God unless he is born again of water and of spirit. And the answer to the reason why that's the case is obvious in verse 6. Verse 6. Flesh gives birth to flesh. But spirit gives birth to spirit. You should not be surprised by my saying you must be born again. It's like obvious. Uh, your broken life, your fleshly life, has... Well, it's a mess, isn't it? And all that that can do, you're not going to bring perfection out of that. You're just going to bring more mess. But if you want to have a fullness of life that only knowing God can bring, if you want the fullness of his authority at work and all the blessings of the world being put back together, you're going to need that spiritual work done by God, the Holy Spirit, breaking in. And we need to stop here and say this. Being a Christian is not simply about turning up at church. Being a Christian is not about a set of beliefs that I nod my head to. Being a Christian is being a total new creation. Being totally rebuilt, rebooted, restarted. So I've given you this example before, but I'll do it again. It's quite simple. It's like, you know, we're always getting little babies running around here, and you see these lovely little babies, and then you, you know, you look at them, and you see the ears are too big, and you see that the nose is, and you're like, no, they're sweet, but really, you know, nose too big, ears too big, big goofy eyes, I think you need to be born again. The Lord Jesus is looking at Nicodemus, the best of the best, and saying, listen mate, spiritually, you're ugly. Spiritually, you're lost. Spiritually, you've got no hope, and you need to be rebuilt from the ground up. You need to be born again. Brilliant! We're going to get there in a minute. Okay, don't worry, good question. Good question, the best question, because that's what he thinks needs to be answered next, so we're going to get there, okay? So the news is, you need a total, fresh start. Okay, I'm going to scan my notes to see whether there's anything that was worth on there, that was actually worth saying. Uh, let's have a look. Uh, da, 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 da. Yeah, no. Okay, fine, we'll carry on. Look, verse 8. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it was going. So it is with everybody born of the Spirit. I suspect that when Jesus said that to Nicodemus, He'd come at night and there was a bit of a storm going on and you can see this dime bar look on Nicodemus' face. In a minute in verse, what is it, verse 10, we find out that he is Israel's teacher, literally the professor of divinity of the biggest university in the land and he's got this like stupid look on his face going, ah, I thought all along it's about what I do to see, get near to God and his kingdom comes in, but actually you're telling me it's all about God coming. He said, yes, yeah, it's a bit like the wind, okay? The wind blows when it jolly well pleases, but you can see the results at the end of it. God is the ultimate spiritual wind, and if people are to be made new, and the kingdom is to come in, and people are to be fixed, and we're to get that ultimate reality that we see, it's going to be not by us trying to do our list of stuff here, but by the wind. God's mighty power coming at his choice to affect and break into a life. So let me go back. A Christian isn't somebody who simply turns and sits in church. A Christian isn't somebody who says, I like to sing the hymns. 
A Christian isn't somebody, according to Jesus, who ascribes and says, I believe that, 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 as good as those things may be. A Christian isn't somebody who gives more than other people to comment relief. A Christian is somebody in whom the Spirit of God, the wind of God, has blown through like a tornado. And they're now a new person because of it. They're a new person. In what way are they a new person? And this helps answer your question and then we'll get to it right at the end, okay? Do you notice what he says back there in verse 5? I tell you the truth, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless he is born of the water, uh, of water and of the spirit. Keep that in your mind, we'll come to it in a second. Jump down to verse 9. Verse 9 is pretty much the same question Nicky had. How do you know? Well, how can this be? What does it look like? Where does this come from? Verse 11. Uh, sorry, verse 10. You're Israel's teacher, and you do not understand these things. I tell you the truth. We speak of what we know, and we testify to what we have seen. But still, you people do not accept our testimony. What's he getting out there? I'll tell you. You are Israel's teacher. You're the professor of divinity. And all the way through the Old Testament, which is the first part of the Bible to get people ready for the coming of Jesus, all the way through there, there's been words that one day God would have to come in and do something radical. Heaven was going to have to break into earth rather than earth trying to climb its way to heaven. And in fact, you remember some of you in the, in the book of Ezekiel. Do you remember in the book of Ezekiel when he says, uh, I will take your hearts of stone and turn them to a hearts of flesh. And he gives us a very, uh, that's in Ezekiel 36. And he gives them a, a, a picture of that in the valley of dry bones. He, there's this vision of, a, of a, a valley full of bones just lying there. You know those like elephant graveyard type things, Ezekiel 37 this is. And they're all these, uh, and it was a picture of what the nation were like spiritually. They were dead and smelly. They'd lost connection with life, which is the true God. And the Lord God comes and he, and he speaks to the bones. And the bones jump up and they're like skeletons looking like something out of some sort of bizarre horror film. But they're there, but they're, they're, it's a half-life and it's an empty life. And then he, he speaks and he blows the wind and suddenly flesh comes on the bones and they're alive. Whereas before they were a pile of smelly bones, now they're alive because the Lord has come and breathed life into them. And so Jesus says, listen, prof, don't you get this? So bad is the human situation that we need a massive intervention. And then he goes, I love this, this is Jesus' humour. You know how uh, Nicodemus came at the start and he goes, oh, we know you, oh, sorry, we know, you know, sort of like the royal we, we know that you're a teacher. So from his college, they're sent along and he's like using the royal we of the college. You know, we're dignified, don't you know? And Jesus comes back and says, I tell you the truth, we, laughing at him, who's he talking about? God the Father, God the Son, God the Spirit. We know something more, mate. We speak of what we know and we testify to what we've seen, but still you people do not accept our testimony. It was all there in the Old Testament, and now as Jesus comes and breaks in and he's turning water into wine, he's clearing the temple, and people are running up to him and saying, you're the son of God. It's breaking in. There's evidence everywhere. We speak of what we know. What was always promised is coming to fulfillment. Verse 12. I've spoken to you of earthly things, but you do not believe. How then will you believe if I speak of heavenly things? And here comes the answer. What's going to happen? No one has ever gone into heaven except the one who came from heaven, the son of man. The first thing, the first way the first indicator that you have had something of an experience of God's grace is that you recognise he has come in the flesh in the person of Jesus. You look at him and you agree no one has ever gone into heaven except the one who came from heaven, the Son of Man. Do you see that? It's a recognition of who Jesus is. You see, Nicodemus, when he came to Jesus, all Jesus was was a prophet, a holy man, a guru, a helper, someone who can give me a little bit of a step up the ladder so I can carry on trying to save myself. And Jesus says the first step is recognising that you're so far gone from that, you need God to come in, and I am him come. I'm the son of man. I'm the rescuing king for the end of the world. And then the second thing you need to see is in verse 14, you need to see that you need to not just recognise who I am, but you need to look to me. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the desert, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes in him may have eternal life. 
Now, for those of you sitting there going, what? What's all that about snake and desert? It's a very obscure little story by packed away in the book of Numbers in the Old Testament where the people have run away from God and tried to build their own successes on their, uh, and depend upon them themselves. Although God was near them, they like, shoved them away and said, you know what, I'll run it my road. The Lord calls them back by sending in a, a plague of snakes. And the plague of snakes are a little bit of a pit. It's ironic, isn't it? Because they're behaving like a plague of snakes. So he sends a real plague of snakes in amongst them. And some of them get bitten by the, the, this plague of poisonous snakes. And they're there and they're dying. But the Lord says, I don't want to leave you that way. And what he does is he gets the, Moses to stick up a pole with sort of like a little snake on it. Now who here has ever seen a paramedic ambulance driving by? What do you see on the side of a paramedic ambulance? It's a pole with a little snake on it. It speaks of healing. And they've got it straight out of the Bible. Okay? It's straight from the story. It's straight from Numbers. So if you have a little look, look at your ambulances, that kind of thing, you'll see the snake. There's a pole and there's a funny snake on everybody goes, well, oh, what's that got to do? It's got to the promise that if you look to us, you'll find healing. You see that? Jesus is saying, that story back in the Old Testament was actually a little bit of a forerunner of me. You see, what those people realised was that they had walked out on God, not treated God as they should have done. And it should have been them on the pole, hanging there, but it wasn't. And if you are somebody who has come to know God, if you want to know whether you've had that... Had Christ do a work in your heart, what you do is you look at the cross and you see Jesus there. You look up and say, that should be me. It should be me paying the price for my own sin, but he is there carrying the weight of my sin so I don't have to anymore. I go free by putting my trust in him. So immediately, whoever you are in this room, you've got a choice. You can either hope to be part of God's kingdom and be in with God and find ultimate reality by doing the the checklist of things and saying, oh, I hope I measured up and I hope I've done enough and maybe Jesus can guide me a little bit but really I'll be the one who saves me. Or you can recognise that Jesus is God's rescuing king who has come and calls us to look to him and put our confidence in him. I say it should be me there. I don't deserve God, I've walked out on God, I've not honoured God in the way I should have done. I've done things and said things that, quite frankly, I'm ashamed of. And although I've not been as bad as I could have been, I've certainly certainly not honoured God like I should have done. But he's there, so I don't have to be. I look to him. See that? So first of all, we'll recognise that Jesus is the Son of God. Come. Then we'll recognise that we actually need to depend and trust on him that everyone who believes in him may have eternal life. Now before I finish, I just want to go back to verse 5. Can you see it there, verse 5? I tell you the truth, that no one can enter the kingdom of God unless he is born of water and of the Spirit. So this is your third test, okay? Hopefully it helps answer your question. Your third test. That idea of being born of water and a born of spirit, some people say it's to do with baptism, it's not. Okay? All the way through the Old Testament, the idea of water is about cleansing. And then being born of the spirit is about having a new, regenerated, new heart. A heart that has different desires and a different focus, where you're not the person you used to be. So how can you know you've been born again? Well, two things happen here. Number one, you know and trust Jesus has made you clean. Oh, you're tempted to look at yourself. Always. You're always tempted to look at yourself and say, do you know, have I done enough? Oh, I had a really bad day. Maybe God won't love me anymore. Maybe I'm not part of his kingdom. Or the next day, you're like, oh, I had a really good day, so I feel great about myself. God's got to love me now. No, no. What you do is you say, I have come to God on the basis of the fact that I've been cleansed. Cleansed by Jesus. Made new. I know my only hope before him, whether I have a good day or a bad day, is that I've been cleansed by Jesus. But then there's this other one, that the Spirit of God comes in and reboots you. What actually happens? I'll tell you what happens. His love comes into you in such a way that it becomes the biggest reality in your life. So it used to be that the biggest reality was what your boss said about you. But when his love comes in, it becomes the big thing. And now, do you know what? I can cope with whatever my boss says about me because 
he's written his love into my heart. He used to be that the biggest thing that would shape who I was as a person was, I don't know what my boyfriend and my girlfriend said about me. But now I know I've got his love that whatever my boyfriend or girlfriend does or doesn't say about me, that doesn't shape me because actually I've been remade in his love. His love, his grace, who he is, his, his mercy coming in and reshaping you, that's the thing that makes you. And you get a whole new identity and a whole new outlook on life. In fact, some of you, yeah, I mean, you've experienced this, haven't you? Some of you, when you were a little kid, you got taught the Bible. Some of you went along to church for a little while and you perhaps you even learned memory verses. In fact, Carol was standing there the other day and telling the team about how she learned a lot of the memory verses. She even used to um, uh, sort of, uh, do a junior church and help with that. So she knew the stories, but they were just stories. They were just facts. And suddenly a day came when she looked back on the same verses and the same stories and oh, it like came alive within her. And it became precious to her. And it became special to her. And that God who was often spoke about, you'd even say, oh God, this and oh God, that didn't do that anymore. Because his name was precious. Because you've been born again. Because his spirit had come in and warmed your heart. And suddenly you found you wanted to read the Bible. And you found that inside of you, when you didn't live the way that you knew he would want you to live, it rather than you're not given a rip, it suddenly you cared. Why? Because you've become born of the water cleansed. And you've got a new spirit. I've got one story for you out in the notes which is worth telling. I'll give you an example of this. Uh, the example I've got is a guy called Augustine. He was sort of a pretty big theologian way back in the, the 3rd and 4th century. But before he became a Christian, uh, he was pretty much addicted to sex. He would go to brothels, he would do all of that kind of thing. He would be out and about. Uh, and then he became a Christian. And he went back to one of the towns, after he'd been converted and, and trusted in the Lord Jesus, he went back to one of the towns where he frequently would go uh, uh, because of certain women who he would meet there and, and spend his time with them. And there was this one particular woman who he'd been particularly intimate with over a long period of time. And when he saw her, he met her. And he was, he was nice and he was warm uh, and kind and considerate. But he was different. She noticed he was different. Now, she didn't know what, how to take this or what to make of it, so they sort of said their pleasantries and they started to walk away, which she thought was very weird for a start. And so she did, she did start to walk away at first, and then she thought, I know what's just happened there. He's mistaken me for somebody else, and he was just being friendly. It was one of those examples. How we've actually done that, the amount of time we've spent together, I don't quite know, but that must have... It's the only, common, the only way I can make sense of this. So she turns back around and she yells, Oi, Augustine, Augustine! Augustine, it's I, she says. And he turned to her and said, Oh, I know, but it's not I. You got that? When you come to meet Jesus, you are not the person you used to be. I tell you, that gets us into all kinds of trouble, doesn't it? Perhaps we've got friends who we're friends with them because, well, we like this and we like that and we, we like the same sort of thing and one of us becomes a follower of Jesus and suddenly... Some of the things we still like to do with those people, but uh, actually we're living for something different now, and oh, it puts tension in the relationship, doesn't it? And sometimes some of you have found this, haven't you, that after you've become a believer, you've drifted a little bit away from your friends. And actually what you need to do is actually say, no, well, no, I'm going to stick with them because I'm going to love them so they can hopefully get the, get the same thing I've got. But it's a difficulty, it's a tension. It? It's a tension. What happens if two people are married and one of them becomes a Christian? Oh... <gasps> They got together because they were both living for this. And now one of them starts saying, do you know what, my life has been turned around by the Lord Jesus. And oh, that's not what I signed up for. Attention. You see? So whatever you do, don't think being a believer has a minimal impact. Being a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ changes absolutely everything. 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 Am I saying that we suddenly become perfect overnight? No. But he writes into us new desires and a new heart to know him and love him. And where does all the power from this come from? Well, you can see it in verse 16, can't you? For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Have you any idea how costly it is for God to come and do bring this new birth into our life? Well, if you don't, then look at the new birth. Well, I, I can remember some of my youngest memories, round right about when I was two or three, 
but I'm pretty confident, although I can't remember when I was born, or as I was about to be born, that what I did was I sort of um, started yelling at the old dear, here, let me give you a hand, and started kicking me way out. No, no, I was born because of her pain, her willingness to go through suffering, and to be honest with you, and we forget this in the day of epidurals, her threat of death. Anybody in the ancient world knew that if you wanted to have a big family, you had to have twice as many as, as you wanted because most of them would die, a lot of them would die in childbirth and, and the infant mortality rate, which is the number of kids who die before um, the age of five, was about 50%. So for somebody to be born, it meant that somebody else had to take on the risk, the pain, the suffering and the threat of death so that, well if it was me, so I could have had life. And you know where I'm going with this, don't you? For God so loved the world that he gave his son who would come himself and take on the pain and the suffering and the shame and not the threat of death but actually go to die so that we could be born into a new life so that we wouldn't perish now or eternally. And that is the measure of God's love for us. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. And so we've done a bit of freestyling here. How do we know? To answer Nicky's question, how do we know we've been born again? Then what we will do is not come to God like Nicodemus does. But we'll come to God how Nicodemus does in the end, and we see this by the end of John's Gospel, because he takes notice of verses 10 through to 16, and instead of looking at himself and his own worthiness or lack of it, what he does is he does, verse 13, 14, he just lifts his eyes and looks at Jesus. He beholds Jesus. He looks at the love of Jesus. He lets that reshape him. And as we look to Jesus, God comes in and the power of the Spirit grabs a hold of that and changes us around so we're unrecognised. And I love having those conversations with you lot. Sometimes we'll talk, well, I'll sit down with some of you and I'll, I'll reflect a little bit on where you were and where you are now. And you can see this re- new birth in action. Oh, we've not got quite as far as we wanted, but we've got a long way to go yet. That's okay. I think one of the exciting things that the team have seen here this week is that they've seen the Lord at work rebirthing people. People who've come to know God in a new way. And it's going on. Isn't that what we should be praying for as a church together? Of course it is. And we want more, and we want more, and we want more. And the Spirit comes in as we look to Jesus for that. So we've freestyled John, one, uh, John 3, 1 to 16, and we've got a song that is a very appropriate to follow it up. And it's that song that we learn off the back of New Word Alive, which actually is a, it's a whole song about how God comes in, grips our soul, brings us cleansing, a new start, so we're not the people we were, we don't have the same things written over our life as we used to, and he calls us home to his promised unbroken land. So we'll play the introduction if you would. We'll stand together and sing, Once I was dead to you and I could not hear, was blind to the truth and was nowhere near. But then you gave me life and you gripped my soul with a love so pure that you won't let go. Hold on, we've got to hold off on that while we just wait for that. Okay? I think that needs a reboot and a rebirth, don't you reckon? Is it there? Oh. Hey, let's stand here and sing. <laughs>